from the patient. And now from the Molina paper, this is uh, this year in the European Journal of Cancer, uh, where they actually put here the responders, and this is stable disease together with progressive disease, they show actually the obvious. If you respond, uh, you're better than if you don't respond. But you cannot actually take any, um, anything out of that. Here is what you can take out, and the previous uh, speaker also told that. There are early and there are late responders in Sumitinib. And that was very, very nice and very, very clear as you saw. Keep on the drug. Don't expect responses. Even the people who will respond later, they may be even doing better than the people who respond earlier. So what do you do? You keep on your first line. You keep on your choice of the first line until you really have a progression. You don't change lines like this. I think this was shown, the mechanism of resistance when you have a VGFR, uh, uh, into, uh, when you are recurring after anti-VGFR, they probably have an mTOR uh, pathway uh, related, but probably there are too many mechanisms of resistance after sunitinib or pisoponib. And then Novartis came with this very nice train and said, okay, you have to change trains. In the beginning, it seemed very nice. Okay, I'm going to change the train. I'm going to ta I'm going to take the Everolimus train. Will that help me? Actually, we we don't know how much it will help you. We know that the progression-free survival with Everolimus is better than the progression-free survival with the placebo. We know that the overall, however, survival is not that much of a difference, is it? But with this data, Everolimus get the approval in the second-line treatment. And of course, this is not a pure second-line treatment, but this is a pure RTK-resistant treatment. It's a pure VGF treatment-resistant uh, line. And what we show is not any overall survival benefit, but again, a progression for survival benefit. They very nicely showed that if you give a Verolimus in the second line, you, you get more than you give it in the third line. And this is not because of the population, because the population on placebo in the second and the third line did the same, exactly the same, 1.87 months. So yes, I can give it earlier, and I can get some benefit, but of course this benefit is a bit blurry. It does not actually correlate to any overall survival benefit yet. What shall I do with my patient? On the other hand, will I keep on the same track? This is the uh, Pfizer trial, the AXIS trial. Keep on the RTKI. The, uh, this is a, a trial that was presented uh, a couple of years ago, where axitinib was better than serafinib in the second line, with a progression-free survival of 6.7 months. The numbers of the progression-free survivals are irrelevant. Okay? Not cross-trial comparisons, first. And second, completely irrelevant for the patient. And with an overall survival it was pretty much the same as well. But hold on, this is a drug against an active drug, isn't it? So what if you say that 35% of the patients had received cytokines, this is not very common now in the world, and they received even a small survival benefit from oxytocin versus serafinib, Whereas the people who had received sunitinib, they probably did a bit worse, but not statistically significantly worse, with axitinib versus serafinib, and the numbers are there. Median overall survival for axitinib 15 months, for serafinib 16.5 months. I love serafinib. It seems to overtake everybody in overall survival, doesn't it? It loses in progression for survival, but anyway. And yes, in any population, Overall survival was a bit better with serafinib after sunitinib. Let's peel off now the AXIS trial. Axitinib versus serafinib in the second line. Was serafinib indicated in the second line? No. Do we have data that serafinib is working in the second line? No. The only data for serafinib we have is that it doesn't work in the first line. Now we'll come back to this again. The only data in the first line we have is serafinib, because it actually doesn't work. 
We have data that it works after interferon against the placebo, and this is the serafinib indication in RCC. People who had received cytokines, they can receive serafinib. And we have retrospective data, and uh, I'm also publishing retrospective data, and I am one of these authors of this uh, maximizing the duration of disease control um, review, which is actually rumors. Okay? Until then, we were living in rumors. Why did we use serafinib in the second line? Because we didn't have anything else. We had only sunitinib, and then when our patient was recurring, other people were using sunitinib after sunitinib, other people were using serafinib after serafinib. Nobody ever, ever took the time to prove that this was of any good, or we didn't harm our patients giving serafinib second line. No. We don't have data that serafinib second line is beneficial compared to something else, like nothing. Is there any need to treat them with an RTKI in the second line? So we have a clinical trial that shows a very, very spectacular post-interferon difference of oxytinib in the second line. But post-sinitinib, the difference is not that much, and serafinib is not indicated. So you have, you have this trial here in your post people where your control arm shouldn't exist. You are allowed to increase the dose only of the one drug. We have data that serafinib is working if you increase its dose. We don't have data that oxytinib is working if you increase the dose unless a phase two data that a third of the population did not receive more overall, more progression-free survival, but received some benefit in responses. So we don't have data that oxytinib should be titrated up. No data for that. However, we use it. So this is a bit of a resistive trial against serafinib because you don't allow the drug that we know that you can increase the dose to dose increase, but you allow the other one. And of course, 37% of the people in the trial had a dose increase of oxytinib. That makes oxytinib really, really an expensive drug if you use it in the, ever, in the everyday uh, practice, doesn't it? And of course, the side effects of an RTKI after an RTKI are a little bit miserable. Okay, I treat people with uh, RTKIs. I have probably something like 100 people in sinitinib, it's like 50 people in presopin, and now I know how it is. I have used the 2 to 1 sequence, the 42 sequence, I've tried to keep them on drug, but I know what life is miserable. And this is why in the Pisces trial, you know, you remember the Pisces trial? Pisces trial, 70% of the population said, get rid of it, I like the other one. And when they asked them, why did you like more sumitinib than pisopinib? What is your first? The first reason of not liking sumitinib and you prefer pisopinib, our patients that are okay, we care for them, say, there's not any specific reason. It makes my life miserable. So what is serafinib? Is serafinib the Romans in the Asterix and Obelix uh, uh, comics? Do we use it to get positive trials? No, because actually, if you see, oxytinib tried to overcome serafinib in the first line, and it failed. It didn't reach a statistical uh, target. We don't have overall survival. Again, nobody cares for progression-free survivals. We don't have overall survival data saying that oxytinib is better than serafinib in the first line. We have progression-free survival. They say oxytinib and serafinib are not different in the first line. Something like tivosinib and serafinib. Can we use an expert opinion to prefer? Why do you prefer Verolimus? Do you use an expert opinion? We have many trials which are retrospective that show that sunitinib to Verolimus patients live longer than sunitinib to Tamsirolimus. By the way, Tamsirolimus is not an mTOR inhibitor. Tamsirolimus is an mTOR inhibitor only on Mondays. Okay? Because you use it once a week. And I failed to use them serolimus even in my poor risk patients because I try to imagine my poor risk patient who is a guy who is probably uh, performance status one to two, he's not that well. 
and he has to come every week to hospital to get his drug. I would prefer to use sunitinib, and I use sunitinib with these people. And there's an, another real world evidence piece of, of uh, information from the United States Chart Review, 30, uh, 434 patients that actually received two lines of treatment. And you can see that people that went to Everolimus lived longer than people that went to Temsirolimus. These are biased data because they are retrospective. But they show you something. They show you that these two drugs are not the same. People that uh, received Everolimus live longer than people that received Sorafenib. What are my conclusions? First of all, my first conclusion is the fourth. Evidence-based medicine should be based on evidence. And you cannot make evidence-based medicine without real good evidence when you're making it. I use Everolimus and I use Excitinib in the second line. I'm not that happy. I prefer Everolimus because it doesn't have the miserable side effect profile of the RTKI, but I'm not that happy. I want to see something more. I don't think we have managed to get over the two and a half years. Okay, we're stuck there since the first sunitinib trial, and we're hitting the two and a half million survival year <coughs> limit. Has everyone who's changed that? I'm not too sure. Maybe a little, but we haven't gone very far away from that. Our effort would be to push it further. But if I'm going to treat a second line patient, I'm not going to look for a response or progression-free survival in the second line. Okay? I'm going to look for his quality of life. Unfortunately, the RTKI to RTKI sequence failed to be proven because nobody asked the question. Uh, it is a doctor. He was operated. It was a clavicula and so on. And the lung a little. The question is, this patient is living and so on. It would, is he in a good state because we offered him treatment for a micrometastatic disease probably after the surgery, or he is living because this long time correlated with proliferating index of only 7%. This is why the metastasis appears so late. So the question is, how long do you treat which target of therapy such a patient? Uh, I'm going to answer with two answers to your question. The first is going to be, have you ever been in San Antonio? San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference? Has anybody been in San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference? In San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference is Vogel New York, who always asks the question. Now, see, he's Vogel New York. And <laughs> now I'm going to answer your question. Um, I wouldn't even treat him. I don't have any data on in brackets, adjuvant treatment after metastasectomy. Uh, is she going to recover again? Probably. When? Sometime. Why give him a difficult time now? I mean, you're not treating him with antibiotics. You're treating him with one of these very, very bad drugs that makes your, your skin yellow, your, you know, your life miserable, diarrhea next, next door. Come on. No, I wouldn't treat him. Thank you very much.